I also think that in 2024, most people in crypto know that these crypto projects are not trying to solve anything that it is purely based on hype like NFTs. I don't think any of the NFT promoters think that there's actually a use case for their NFT. It is speculation, which is I have nothing against speculation. I just wish there was more honesty in this space when promoting this, you know, the shit coins. Mm -hmm. And also like in consumer tech, it makes sense that, you know, th that's why you thought that Litecoin could be better than Bitcoin, because in consumer tech, some company might come out with a new phone that is literally just better and faster than the phone from this other company. And that's the mindset I also have. That's why I went into deep into shit coins because I thought Bitcoin is all tech and there has, hasn't been that much innovation in Bitcoin compared to these other projects that move and build fast and are cutting edge. But again, it's like somebody might come up with a better internet protocol, but nobody's going to switch to it because TCP IP is the king of internet protocols and there's a huge cost to switching. That's also what helped me to like solidify my conviction in Bitcoin is that even if a better Bitcoin comes up, even though that's impossible because I think Bitcoin has immaculate conception. It's still, there's a huge switching cost to switching to another system. And that's why, you know, Bitcoin has this Lindy effect. All right, Arsen, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks for having me on, Bram. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to chat. I think we've, we've been in touch uh, before and I think we'll have a fun conversation about uh, your, your journey into, uh, into Bitcoin and, uh, and your outlook for, for the future. I, I wanted to start with, you know, you are a young guy, totally immersed in the Bitcoin space. And I wanted to start with, uh, yeah, the question how, how you initially got into, into Bitcoin. So it was year 2017. Obviously, we all know what happened in 2017. That was big Bitcoin rally. There was a big bull market. So I think, and I don't have the exact dates, but I think I bought the top of 2017 rally. So that that was probably 19,000. And obviously, you know what happened after that. Bitcoin went down for like one year straight. So that's how I discovered Bitcoin. I, I bought at the top and then I had a lot of time to reflect of what just happened because I, I lost a lot of money on paper. Of course, I never sold. And uh, but when I discovered Bitcoin, I was into all kinds of shit coins. I had all the shit coins you can think of, like basically all of them, I was collecting them like stamps. Yeah. And then when I, when I, during the 2018, 2019 bear market, I had a lot of time to reflect and like most Bitcoiners, they come to the conclusion that, okay, actually like, uh, you know, blockchain do doesn't have that many use cases that it is actually not the most effective technology for organizing data. And you actually only need it for like very critical applications, which money is one of them. Yeah, 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 I, I, I agree. It's, and, and also when you combine it with, you know, permission or permissionless blockchains, right? Like uh, you have all these companies doing blockchain projects, uh, et cetera, but when it's just permissioned, they are still in control of, you know, who uses the blockchain and, and what people can write on it. Yeah, then it's just a fancy database, right? I like, I like yeah. that term, but the only use case for permissionless blockchain, uh, I would argue, is, is money or at least the, the most important one. Interesting. But and how did you get into the shit coinery or crypto first? Like, were you thinking about, you know, was that for fun or were you like really trying to invest, grow wealth? I was a total degenerate. I just wanted to make money. I think I've, I heard about crypto on some random, random Finnish Facebook group. And there was a link to some kind of shady crypto exchange and I clicked it. And I think the exchange went under after a few years, but that was basically how I started getting into the rabbit hole. And obviously like I was very swayed by the, by the good marketing from the shitcoin projects. And uh, I was a total believer until, you know, you know, you need to get rugged a few times, a few rug pulls here and there, and then you learn a lesson, just like a kid touching a stove. Uh, but I want to, I want to like, actually, cause you mentioned that like blockchain is a very inefficient way to store data. I heard VJ Boyapati, uh, I don't know if you know VJ, he has written a lot about Bitcoin and he calls it yeah. like, he calls the blockchain a toxic waste. That's how he likes to describe it. So it's a very inefficient way to organize and store data, but it is only like, you need this toxic waste to achieve permissionless system, which most systems don't actually need it. So I really like that description yeah. that blockchain is like a toxic waste. It's like, it's like a necessary evil. You need it to achieve this one thing, which is decentralization and permissionless. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's interesting also now still people, you know, I, I would say six, seven years after this last 
you know, big up and down because I don't really count 2020 as like a real uh, run, but, you know, seven years after 2017, people are still saying like, oh, blockchain is going to change everything. And this technology, uh, I heard Kamala Harris uh, say last week, uh, we're going to be a leader in blockchain, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, it's just a, a type of technology application, but it should be used within a bigger use case. Like, what are you using it for, right? So it's not it's not that fancy, but there's experts on LinkedIn everywhere. Right? Yeah, I think I get like at least three messages a week from blockchain experts trying to sell me a solution for Relay. Yeah, and then when you just when you look into it, it's just like. This doesn't make any sense. This was written by ChatGPT. You have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. It's it's this. Yeah, I like what you said. Like sometimes I read it and I'm like, I'm 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 quite a technologist myself, and I've been in in the tech space for like twelve years, and I don't even understand what this tagline is about, right? Like it's just I don't know. It's in in the in the I don't know what's the what's the sense like in the land of blind people, you know, the person with one eye is the king, <laughs> you know, it feels, it feels like that, like, uh, we should hire this blockchain expert. But so when you went from this degenerate to eventually becoming a Bitcoiner, what was your biggest moment? You know, you realized this about blockchain, you mentioned decentralization, you get rocked a few times. What, what is your biggest distinction between crypto and, and Bitcoin and what made you go all in on Bitcoin? Well, if there was a single moment when I realized that Bitcoin is really different from crypto, but definitely when I started thinking about Bitcoin and as, and money as a, as a network and the fact that like most money tends to one, like if the world could be using one money, we would be using one money. Of course, now it's not possible because we have different governments who want to use their own money. They want to issue their own money, but it's like Bitcoin has network effect. So every added user to a network benefits the whole network as a whole. And then it's, it's really hard to dethrone the, the, the king of the networks. And it's the same with social media. Like if, if, if there's three users on Facebook, nobody's using it, but every single user, new user on Facebook benefits the old users. And that's how the network grows. And uh, yeah, that, that was a big realization that like multi coin future really doesn't make sense from economics. I think we will have uses for crypto but it's not going to be money and nobody and people like, like when we had Litecoin, like one of the first altcoins, they were trying to go after the money use case. But I think now crypto projects have realized that, okay, it, you know, nobody, nobody's going to believe us, you know, if we push the, that we're going for the money narrative. So they just do something else, which, which is now NFTs and, uh, and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very good point because when I got in bit into Bitcoin 20, I want to say early mid 2013, eventually I found Litecoin, obviously, and I really thought Litecoin was the improvement on Bitcoin. I actually even held a talk about Litecoin at a big bank where there was like someone talked about Bitcoin and I was talking about Litecoin as the challenger to Bitcoin. But but I think this argument that you said is really good, right? So the use case for Bitcoin is money and it has won that race, let's say, you know, when you look at all the cryptocurrencies, you know, basically everything came after Bitcoin and because they cannot win this race for money, they're trying to market themselves. You also mentioned marketing, you know, in all these crypto coins, they're trying to market themselves as a, sol a better, faster, fancier solution to, you know, yeah. use case, whatever, whatever, whatever. and. I think for me, the biggest distinction is, you know, once I realized Bitcoin is the invention of, or well, the, the creation of perfect money and the discovery of absolute digital scarcity and crypto tokens are tokens created by startup teams that want to create an ecosystem in which these tokens are used to do something, something, but, you know, to, yeah. so to, to exchange within the participants of that system, but yeah. I haven't seen lots of use cases where these systems actually solve a problem, right? It's all, uh, you just said, like I was a, de a degenerate, right? But it is gambling. It's like people buy these tokens, so the price goes up, but nobody really talks about the problem that these tokens solve. I think that that's a very, probably yeah. a very, very tiny group that's actually interested in that. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? 
Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. Yeah, but I also think that in 2024, most people in crypto know that these crypto projects are not trying to solve anything mm -hmm. that is just purely based on hype, like NFTs. Like, I don't think any of the NFT promoters think that there's actually a use case for their NFT, you know, like, yes, it's linked to something, you get some kind of fright in this closed system, but really it is speculation, which is, I have, I have nothing against speculation. I just wish there was more honesty in this space when promoting this, you know, the shit coins. Mm -hmm. And also like it, in consumer, in consumer tech, it makes sense that, you know, that, that's why you thought that Litecoin could be better than Bitcoin because in consumer tech, like, yes, some company might come out with a new phone that is literally just better and faster than the phone from this other company. And that's the mindset I also have. That's why I went into deep into shit coins because I thought, yeah, Bitcoin is all tech and there has, hasn't been that much innovation in Bitcoin compared to these other projects that move and build fast and are cutting edge. But like, again, it's like somebody might come up with a better internet protocol, but nobody's going to switch to it because TCP IP is the king of internet protocols and there's a huge cost to switching. So that's, that's how I, that's also what helped me to like solidify my conviction in Bitcoin is that it doesn't make sense to like, even if something, if, even if a better Bitcoin comes up, even though that's impossible because I think Bitcoin has immaculate conception, it's still, there's a huge switching cost to switching to another system. And that's why, you know, Bitcoin has this Lindy effect. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the Lindy effect is, you know, the longer it exists and stays alive, the higher the chance that it will keep on staying alive, basically, right? That it doesn't die. I have to think about, I just saw a talk by, I don't know his last name, but his handle is Anil Setso. Do you know him? Like he creates like really yeah. nice slides. He has like a really great book also to explain Bitcoin. But he, he had a slide where it was like a Venn diagram of one part was money and the other part was networks, right? So what you also talk about networks and Bitcoin is basically in the, in the middle. And he explains like, if you only look at it from the networks perspective, you will miss the, the, the bigger picture of Bitcoin. And if you only look at it from the money perspective, you will also miss the bigger perspective on, on, on Bitcoin. I, I would argue that this Venn diagram is a bit bigger. There's, there's more like dimensions. But uh, for example, the technology dimension is what all these crypto tokens talk about, right? We are faster, more throughput per second, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, if we ask the question for what, then th there are not really use cases actually used by people. Well, perhaps stable coins, I wouldn't really count them as true crypto, yeah. by the way. But yeah, it's just they're arguing from this technology point of view where Bitcoin is way more than than just the technology and i think as you mentioned you know the networks part is, is is probably the biggest thing you know like you can just copy bitcoin you can copy the code you can you can literally start i can start bramcoin tomorrow with the bitcoin code but nobody will be incentivized to use it yeah it's like unless you are somebody like adam back he he might have gotten Bitcoin immediately, even though he also didn't get. But again, like you explained, there's a Venn diagram and you need to be kind of well versed in all of these things. So networks, technology, and then also economics. And most of us are not. That's why when we come to Bitcoin, like, you know, you came in 2013, you said, or 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And me in 2017, we didn't get Bitcoin immediately because we lacked the context. We, you know, you, know yeah. you need to study all these other disciplines. And that's when it starts making sense. Yeah. And so what and, were you like educated on finance or, or economics, money, risk, wealth? Like, did you have a background in that or did that come later? No, not really. I mean, I had a few economics courses. So I have a degree in business administration, which uh, I think is a 
pretty useless degree, to be honest. <laughs> Never used it for anything. But also, I mean, I, I went through a public school system and I, I think there's a reason why they don't teach about money or, or even also finance. It's almost like they don't want you to get wealthy. They don't even teach you like how to avoid taxes. Like, so I, I definitely like all the odds were stacked against me, which is everybody who grow, goes through the public school system in Europe. I don't know about other countries, but they don't teach you any of this. So to me, it was literally, you know, the meme with the Indian guy. I'm in it for the technology. So like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I came in for the money and I'm, I'm still in it for the money. Like, let's, let's be clear about that. But now also there's all these other things that motivate me to be interested in Bitcoin, talk about Bitcoin and be full-time working in Bitcoin. Yeah. So what do you think? Um, I talk a lot about this on, on a podcast. Like I, you know, there's a lot of resources online where you can factually learn, you know, how Bitcoin works. But as you mentioned, you know, people come in from these different interests or point of views or dimensions and they are not you know well first in in everything that bitcoin touches so it takes a while to well be incentivized or challenged or motivated to to study right and kind of like challenge your mind what what has really helped you to challenge your mind or what do you think is is like a personal characteristic that you have that helped you to yeah kind of like go through this learning arc that's an interesting question I wish I could interview lots of Bitcoiners and ask them, like, for example, like, what is something you did as a kid that would kind of like show me that you would become a Bitcoiner? I think we're a very different bunch of people, but I think what there's a few themes to I've noticed when talking with Bitcoiners is uh, first curiosity. Like if you're not a curious person, I mean, you're not going to be interested in Bitcoin because there's so much to learn. Like the rabbit hole is really deep. And also I think kind of like this punk fuck you attitude also exists in Bitcoin. I think I had less of that. I think I'm more on the curious side and like issues with authority. This is like the most common themes I see in Bitcoin. And uh, the, the more, the more mainstream Bitcoin goes, the less I see it because we get all kinds of people in it. But I think especially the early group of Bitcoiners, definitely very, you know, into anarchy and no respect for authority, but also like very curious. Yeah. yeah I think if I would answer that question, I would probably also say curiosity and kind of like I want to. So, for example, like if I would hire a plumber to do something here in my house, right, like that I couldn't do, that's why I hire him. I would look at what he's doing, not to like control him, but to just understand what he's doing. Like, that's really what I'm like. Like, I, I'm just interested to see how something works. And yeah, so, so that's also what I would say, like just the curiosity part, like just not accepting something at face value and always kind of like being interested to at least dive into something for a little bit. And if it really... Uh, interests you, then, you know, yeah, I've gone on tangents for, you know, weeks <laughs> into a certain yes. Holes. yes, me too. And, and this is not always healthy to have, to have this kind of brain mm -hmm. because then you learn a lot of stuff that is just like not productive for you. It's like, you know, we have division of labor where, you know, you, you should let your plumber do his job and you don't need to know how it happens. But I think Bitcoiners like doing things themselves. They don't like to trust. They want to verify that the plumber <laughs> installs everything. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, so next time you don't have to pay the plumber. You can do it yourself. Well, maybe it's kind of like a control freak behavior disguised by curiosity or something. You know? Yes, probably. <laughs> yeah. <Either> both. <laughs> yeah, fun. So, you know, you are, you, 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 you studied, you challenged yourself. You are a young millennial. How, how do you experience talking about Bitcoin with like our generational peers? In real life, I think online it's easier, right? But in yeah. real life, our generation, we're the same generation because you're a bit older. I think yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm older, but I'm a, okay. I'm a millennial. Definitely. You're not a, you're not a boomer yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, thank you. Otherwise this podcast would be called. Are you getting back at for because, boomers? <laughs> because I asked you if you're, you're a Gen Z before we started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit, a little bit. Okay. Okay. When I speak to millennials, I mean, honestly, it's like, I mean, you know, it's different topics that appeal to different people. Of course, you have to read the room and understand who you're speaking to. You might be speaking to people that are really not motivated by money. But for example, I don't know, justice 
then you might need to have a different angle. But there's a few topics that always come up to mind. The fact that millennials are, especially the, the young millennials like me, not, not old guys like you, we are being kind of priced out of a lot of things. For example, big one is a real estate market. So it's, it's getting close to impossible, especially in big metropolitan cities to acquire, to buy a house. So things like that. Also, like I would say most people want kids, but it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive to raise kids mm -hmm. and it just feels like everything's kind of getting more expensive and our salaries are not keeping up. So that's like a, that's very, very big thread. I like to pull on when talking with my peers because we all notice it. We can't exactly pinpoint what's the cause. And if you listen to conservatives, they would say uh, that it's the, you know, the, the welfare state spending programs, it's illegal immigrants. And then if you listen to people on the left, they would say that this is because of, you know, spending, uh, war spending in different countries, you know, so we're fed all these narratives, but, but, uh, but nobody really questions that. Okay. Actually we're being priced out because we have shit money mm -hmm. that is working against us. Like Michael Saylor says, melting ice cube and it's melting so slow. We can't really see it. But then of course, if you do like a time lapse, you see that it's, it's melting there. Yeah. So like, yeah, my generation is definitely feeling the pain. So th that's something I like to talk about, but of course it, it depends on like, uh, first I like to get to know people and see kind of what their aspirations are. And then uh, if I see a connection to Bitcoin, I just, I just go for it. You know, yeah. you, you can't, you don't, you don't want to be the Bitcoin guy screaming from the roof, how Bitcoin is a solution to everything. You have to, have to first understand the problem of the person you're speaking to. Then you have to build a bridge to the solution. And usually like, of course, if they want to get a girlfriend, like, I don't know how Bitcoin helps there. Maybe it does. If you have a lot of Bitcoin, you can get a girlfriend. But, that's the meme. But very least, often, right? <laughs> that's the meme. Yes. Yes. But usually Bitcoin, because you know, like how people say that half of the economy, like Bitcoin, like money is half of every trade. Like when you buy something, the other half of the trade is, is money. So money is literally affecting everything in the economy. So you can always tie their problems to Bitcoin, but you know, you need to think first, what is the issue they're experiencing? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's a very good point. I think I am so I'm personally so into this and so so I feel so motivated to tell other people about it that I sometimes kind of like skip past this. You know, I, I don't pitch Bitcoin like straight up like, you know, this is Bitcoin. But I find it interesting that, you know, a lot of people, yes, like you said, they are experiencing these higher prices, these questions of, you know, where am I going to live? How am I going to pay for that? Can I build a family? You know, what does my future look like? Retirement, whatever. But they also look at the world and they see problems, right? Like it's, yeah, it seems like a never ending stream, right? If, especially if you watch the news of, of like all this negative stuff. But I, I, I do find it pretty easy to eventually weave in Bitcoin or at least talk about the topic of money because I, I do believe that like everything that you would ever want to fix in the world, whatever is close to your heart, is probably fucked up because the money is fucked up, right? Because as you said, it's, it's half of each trade. And so if you have bad money and you are trading this bad money, yeah, you're also creating bad incentives. Like why would I put in any effort or value in creating something when my reward is money that just loses value, right? I think that's one example, but also, yeah, just the fast yeah. money or the consumerism, etc. It's like the, the marshmallow test, you know, the marshmallow test where they, they give, you know, they tell kids that either you yeah. wait a little bit and you get two or you can have one now. So like economy on fiat money is like marshmallow test, but there's never two marshmallows. You just wait forever yeah. and your marshmallow gets smaller. Yeah. So you better eat it immediately. So everybody exactly. always chooses one. Yeah. It's, I had a podcast with Seb Bunny where we talked about, went, went really deep on, you know, what is money. And he said something and I'm probably butchering, you know, the, the quote, but like, we are incentivized to spend our money as quickly as possible because the current, in the current moment, it's worth the most. And when he said some, that, I was like, damn, that's, that's it. Right. And I think it's very subconscious. People don't consciously do this, but in some way we are 
more consumers than builders because of the money losing value all the time. Yes, and the extre- the most extreme example of this is in Argentina when they get their salary. They run to the store where they can build, they can buy building equipment and they just build another room in their house because it's like either I build this room right now yeah. or it's going to be next week, half of yeah. the money. So they're, they're definitely builders and consumers. <laughs> yeah. And I, <laughs> that's a good one. But I think this is interesting, right? Like they're, I don't know how people in the West would look at Argentina like right now, but before I think, you know, and, and we, we know like if you look into Argentina, was a very prosperous country, right? The richest country in South America. And in that country, this, what you just said is happening. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, why would I stack this money to spend it later? I can, I can better make my house bigger. Like if that is your incentive, that's, it, it's wild. Yeah. And it, it, it kind of warps everything in your head. Like, you know how Michael Saylor, he has the domain hope.com. And it leads to Bitcoin. Yeah. And I think that is so true. Like to me, Bitcoin is representation of hope. Like Bitcoin is a promise and saving in Bitcoin is a promise of a better future. And you can get through a lot of shit. Just, you just need to believe that future is going to be better than right now. And when your money is doing what it does in Argentina, it's really hard to be hopeful and a society without hope. It's, it's not a society I want to live in. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that's how you get like this dystopian, scary dystopian scenarios where nobody has hope and everybody's just really short term oriented. And you get all these like second and third effect problems, which, you know, like we can talk about later, but like there's so many problems that are where the root cause is money. Yeah. Well, I think for millennials, and you touched upon it earlier, like, can I afford a family? Do I want to build a family, right? Like if you're late 20s, early 30s, that's kind of the period where you well, think about that or have a discussion with your partner if, if you're in a relationship, right? And I think I got this from Dina Moose, where he says, like, everyone discounts the future, right? Because the future is uncertain for everyone. So even with perfect money, you would have this conversation, right? Like, do we want kids or where do we want to live or how would would we want to raise them like big questions about this big decision but because the money is so bad and it loses value into the future you 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 discount the future even more and that makes you very nihilistic it doesn't give you hope for the for the future it's like i don't even want to live in the future because it feels so uncertain when i think about it now right and I think that's just a really, that's a hard conversation to have. Like, how can you plan for the future if you don't have hope, if you're not optimistic for the future? And yeah, I agree with you. Like if the second order effect is if people don't have kids, eventually, you know, less people in a country, less productivity, you know, it's kind of this flywheel effect of even a worse worse outlook on the future. Yeah. And, the, you know, the governments work with central banks and they have these programs to incentivize people to find jobs and to have kids to, you know, give uh, benefits to mothers who have like five kids or plus. But at the end of the day, again, it's a very short term thinking. Like if they really wanted a prosperous economy, they would mm-hmm. have a long term mindset and do something about the money. Mm-hmm. But that's it's yeah. Nihilism is such a big problem. Like I see so much pessimism right now, especially with uh, luckily our generation is is OK. But the Gen Z, when you talk to them, it's they have a quite a bleak worldview because you know the world is going to be destroyed because of climate warming. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Greta Thunberg, and the, the populists are taking over, and uh, there's more racism and violence in the world. Which, by the way, like statistically, is just not true. The world is becoming better and safer place, but they just have this very nihilistic mindset, and a big cause of that is because all of these problems come, you know, they stem from money being so yeah. broken. And it's like, we can't even comprehend. There's going to be studies in like 15, 20 years about what, how fiat money fucked up our brains for years. We don't even know what it's doing to us now. We don't have the whole, the full picture. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree to that. And I also think millennials are the ones that can bring this Bitcoin thing more forward because we know, I think a world without technology or early technology, and we've seen how that's grown, how it changed the world, you know, and I think we can make a good distinction or at least make an attempt to see 
the reality versus what what has been told to us, right? Like, you know, you go to school and college and, you know, find a partner, buy a house, get a job, kids, et, et cetera. Uh, but the reality is, as, as you alluded to before, that's just not so easy as it was for our parents or our grandparents, right? It's just a, 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 a totally different time. So we realized that this, what has been told to us is just not possible anymore. And we are, ver you know, equipped to find information on the internet. You know, all the information is literally out there. I think that's how we learned also about Bitcoin and all these other touching subjects, right? And yeah, we we have this skill set to challenge this narrative that that has been sold to us. But I think for Gen Z, they don't really have that perspective of yeah, I, I don't know. If, I, I don't know if it's about information or something like that, but I feel that's kind of the difference. Yeah, I think millennials is like an in-between generation because we still remember life before technology on social media, whereas Gen Z, they're totally brought up in the age of social media where they see all these narratives and they have like opinions, they form opinions at very young age because, you know, they're on social media and they're influenced there. But I, I also think millennials, I think, yes, millennials is going to be a big push for Bitcoin just because I don't have the statistics, but we're about to inherit a lot of wealth from mm -hmm. boomers yeah. as a generation. And we are, again, like you said, we are also tech forward generation. And like, where do you think that money is going to flow? And I, I made a calculation in my newsletter. I, I don't remember exactly that, but there's like millennials really like Bitcoin also crypto assets, unfortunately, and there mm -hmm. will inherit a lot of wealth from boomers. So that's going to be a big catalyst. That's like, obviously, slowly, like more money from millennials going to flow into Bitcoin because millennials are also realizing that, okay, I, I, you know, like maybe 10 years ago, like this podcast could have never happened. We wouldn't be talking about how broken money is, which just wasn't the conversation people yeah. had. But now people are openly talking about it. I see people on Twitter, you, like even outside of Bitcoin, casually throwing around the word fiat, which like was unheard of 10 years ago. People didn't talk about fiat. It was US dollars. And now yeah, people are making that, yeah. the <laughs> good one. Yeah. People yeah. are making very clear distinction that, okay, this is fiat money. And then there's all these other free market monies. So like Bitcoin, gold, and also like some shit coins. Yeah. So that's also very encouraging to see that it has seeped into people's mind that there is this money by decree, paper money, government money, promise money. And then there is this free market alternatives. Yeah. So that's very positive to see. Yeah. Yeah. I think very good point. And, and that's also what I meant with, I think millennials are equipped to find more information about, well, the current system and this new system. And then also be able to compare that with each other, right? I think those are the skills that that we gathered. Like, how do you find information on the internet? How you, do you judge information on, on the internet? For Gen Z, I, I'd argue that's way harder. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm not Gen Z, but that's kind of my, my perception as well. And yeah, like you said, you see these Instagram reels or TikToks, right? Where people are like, I have two degrees and I'm rolling sushi in some fucking <laughs> sushi restaurant. What is going on? Right. Or my watermelon is $12 or, or something like that. So yeah, I, I, I think we've seen this big change. You know, I mean, if, 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 if I think back, so yes, this will show that I'm a bit older than you, but 20 years ago, I, I see the difference. Right. I see, I, I, I just, when I think of 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago and, and compare it to now, it is less nice. Things are. Well, it's because you lived through the change. Exactly. You've yeah. seen before and after, whereas yeah. if you're born in like, let's say 2006, like my little sister, it's kind of been the same. Like exactly. it, it yeah. really accelerated during yes. our time. Yeah. And so they, yes. So I think that's, uh, that's nice. Like it stayed the same and the same means not really a nice outlook for the future. That's already there for them. Right. Yeah. 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 But, but, yes. but actually I think that most people also in our generation will never care about Bitcoin. You know, it's just one of those things where, unfortunately, most people don't want to know how things work under the hood. Mm -hmm. Of course, when it comes to their wealth, they want to they wanna make smart decisions. But even when it comes to people's wealth, people are really bad with money, which again, you have to ask yourself why, for example, in Europe, and I'm pretty sure it's in US too, why is there no classes that teach us about money, saving money, economics classes, maybe Netherlands, 
might be different because you're more finance savvy, but there's well, none of this in place. I, I talked to Leon Wankum. He's from Germany. He's a master, master in economics. And he said, I never learned what money is. So maybe that's the answer to your question. You know, even a master in economics hasn't, has never learned what, what money is. And yeah, I mean, this is one of these little, I don't want to say red pill things, but if you, if you just hear that and you think about, okay, if he doesn't know and I don't know what money is, right? No, no one ever taught me. Why is that? Does that have a purpose? It makes no sense because we use money every day. Like literally, as you said, you know, each trade, half of the trade is money. So why don't we understand what, what money is? And the only, rational, logical answer is that it is on purpose. Because if you would know what money should be and what you are being forced to use now, you would quickly see that that is not even money, right? Like uh, in my country last week, they agreed upon a new law where cash payments above 3000 euros are prohibited. Shit. But just that, just that, like, okay, so you have money, but if you have more than 3000, you cannot really use it, you know, and and they say it's under the guy, you know, the, under the guise of money laundering, you know, and solving that and blah blah. Yeah, yeah. But do you do you think like us not being taught in school about money? Do you think that is like on purpose? Sometimes I struggle with this. How much is it on purpose? How much are they like sitting there and planning the curriculum? Uh, like, I don't think. Or how much, is, how much is how much is how much is it about like just. Also, the people that make the curriculum not actually knowing how I, money works because one hundred percent that the latter. Yeah, I think this yeah. is a very good question. By the way, I don't think there's a there's a day or something. We just have a system. There's a system that no one really questions, and there's people that eventually grow up and you know have a job or whatever, and they end up in positions of power within this system. And I think it's kind of like an organic or natural thing to keep a system alive because you have the assumption or idea that it's working. So yeah. I think it's not really on purpose, but what I don't understand, but maybe that's the curiosity part again, or the no problem with authority part again, is it's very easy to poke holes in it, right? It's very easy to ask certain, you know, critical, logical questions that cannot really be answered in a coherent way. And that should, should scare you, right? Like that's, at least that's my idea, but in reality, that's not really what is happening. So yeah, maybe that's, I, I don't know if that's human nature or certain psychology. Uh, I think it's a bit of both. Also like when your salary depends on a system working a certain way, like why would you question it? Like don't, don't yeah, bite course, the yeah. hand that feeds you. Like, have you seen that clip of Chris Pratt? Like he was a chief economist at ECB and they just asked him how money is created. <laughs> Even he couldn't answer it. He was just getting confused by his own yeah. answers. Yeah. And then he's talking with his assistant, but, but that, that is literally the only thing that makes me, I don't want to say nihilistic, but really doubt other people sometimes where I think like, yeah. that should not be okay. Like really not be okay. Right. But the guy, well, that I think from that video that, that you mentioned, is, wasn't he like X, like he, he left already, but yes, yes. The person, the, the people in charge should understand what they are in charge of. If you don't understand, you shouldn't be in charge of anything, right? That goes for anything but especially money. Uh, I think that's a very idealistic thing to say. I know, but I mean, right. I, 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 I agree, <laughs> but it's like most people don't know how anything works. We just, you know, once it works and it's been working for, let's say 20 years, we stop questioning it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same with Bitcoin. Most people will not care, but Bitcoin, just because it is like better money, most people will end up owning it anyway. So for example, MicroStrategy like, is stacking a lot of Bitcoin and I don't know if they're already in S&P 500 or they will be soon. I think there's a few criteria they need to hit to get listed. And if MicroStrategy gets listed in S&P 500, like every American who owns S&P 500 will be indirectly exposed to Bitcoin because yep. there's like a, they, they like, there's a weighted allocation system. So like the bigger the company, the more of S&P 500 index, uh, yep. the, the more of the company shares is in this index. So I think that's how, Bitcoin adoption is going to happen to like for the majority of people. Of course, that is paper Bitcoin. 
which is not good. You can be a rock pool. It's the paper Bitcoin is not any better than, than fiat money. But uh, unfortunately, I think that's how it's going to happen, especially with the limitations on the Bitcoin system. Like, you know, the, like not everybody's going to be afford, not, not everybody's going to afford to use on chain, on chain Bitcoin. Yeah. So what do you think is the most surprising thing that you learned about yourself going through? this journey? Uh, well, like I'm a self-prescribed pessimist, always been more pessimistic. Maybe that's like a defense mechanism against the world. Uh, but definitely Bitcoin has taught me that I'm actually an optimistic person. Once you give me the, the right tools, I am yeah. optimistic. So I went from a pessimist to an optimist. So that was a, that was the biggest change. I'm, I'm hopeful for the future. I, I want to start a family. I want to own a house. I, I think, yes, that's like the biggest change I've seen in myself. It's just my attitude towards the world. And again, like we talked about earlier, like Bitcoin has given me hope and I can see it in my everyday life. I take better care of myself because, you know, I know I want to live a long time so I can enjoy all the, you know, all the labor I've put into, I've put in right now so I can enjoy it later. So very long-term thinking and it's really made me a better person for myself, but also for the people around me. Nice. Yeah, I discovered that I always saw money as buying time. So every time that I had some money or sold a few products along the way that I created, I always saw it as like time to figure out what is next. But I only realized that I was doing that when when I really got into Bitcoin, that I was already valuing my time in in some way but that this really emphasized it right and i love what you said like it's more once you become really aware of the limited amount of time you have you become way more how to say like strict in what you spend your time on right whether it's well you you had a pretty big newsletter you sold that to focus on on other things right i think it's it's stuff like that that really makes you question yeah what should i spend my time on and not not do something just for money Right. Like just just have some sort of job, for example. Yeah. I mean, there's an old saying time is money, probably because we always known that, you know, time is money and money is time. I can very much uh, relate to that. That's like like you said, I, I stopped writing my newsletter because I realized it's it's not worth my time. I think my time is worth more than the, the newsletter. Of course, like if you enjoy, like, for example, if you enjoy having conversations with different people, which is, I assume you do, you can't always like add a price tag to that. But definitely uh, like, also like you said, like I've really learned to value my, my time. And I always ask myself, is this worth my time? Like, for example, somebody, you know, somebody wants to have a quick call with me. I'm like, I is this really, is this really worth it? So like, when, where, like, when I first got into Bitcoin, it was Bitcoin is the ultimate asset. But then once you are in Bitcoin a little bit, few years, you realize that it's not actually Bitcoin, it's time. Bitcoin is just a tool to, to get more time to do yeah. things that you, that give you pleasure in life. Yeah. So you quit the newsletter, but you, you still, uh, you work in Bitcoin. How do you stay updated on? like developments in, in the Bitcoin space or, or like news or whatever, like, are there, are there any specific things that you do? So I work in Bitcoin space. I work for Relay and I do social media. So even if I'm not trying to be updated, I am still, I'm getting all this information anyway. A lot of it is noise, like nothing new, but it's my job to stay up to date. I still enjoy Bitcoin news. That's why I was writing my newsletter. And honestly, I, just because of the nature of my job, I'm pretty up to date on the developments. Yeah. So how do you see that the functional role of, of creators in the Bitcoin space, like yourself or me doing a podcast or you no know, people writing books, etc. I mean, creators are in every space because people need to like information is free and people always need to look up to somebody and like how we get mass adoption is especially like the right kind of adoption where we get good people. In the beginning, it's really important to have the right people that build the right tools. So then when the masses arrive, you can have the best practices in place. Like for example, Relay by default, it's 100% self-custodial. So people don't even have to think about it. That's because we had the right people to build it. 
and creators, their their job is really important because they are educating people. Like a lot of people listen to your podcast and not every episode is going to be relevant, but there's always going to be somebody who, you know, he says the right thing that just perfectly clicks in your mind because mm -hmm. you already knew something. And now there's a connection. Like, for example, for me, a big unlock, I still, I will never forget is when I heard safety in debate, George, what's his name? George Selgin. And he just said a thing. He said many things during this episode that just like connected the dots for me. And that was a huge unlock. And I had different moments like this after I've listened, like just consuming content where some guest just says something that I can really relate because he had a similar yeah. life experience and it just clicks for me. And my conviction, conviction just becomes so much stronger. Yeah. Yeah, I love that you say that. That's the entire point. My, my Well, I have two goals. One is have fun conversations that inspire myself and then just create as many possible touch points to achieve what you just said, right? I mean, my journey is the same. I just read and listen and watch, watch videos. And yeah, sometimes there are these things that people say where you have to like scroll back and be like, okay, yeah, this, this really adds like this to this little puzzle piece or it's a new puzzle piece in understanding, right? And then you kind of grow like, I couldn't retrace my steps, by the way. Like there's some of these things. Actually, one of my biggest insights was from a podcast about energy, which was totally not related to Bitcoin. But even that, right? Like you're just on this curiosity journey and, and just trying to pick up these little pieces to, yeah, to build your understanding. Yeah. And most of us, we are alone. So I don't know how many Bitcoiners live around you, Bram, or how often you go to meetups. I love this point. Yeah. I had like one or two people in real life. And of course, like online, it's, you know, tens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people, right? Now my circle is a bit bigger, but it was very, very lonely. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's still very lonely just because I also live in a place where there's not a lot of Bitcoiners. So like this, the, for example, this podcast is a safe space for Bitcoiners to, to listen to like-minded people, but also get inspired, also get ideas because there's so many things to learn in Bitcoin and there's always something you can learn from somebody else, either in terms of like what they do with their Bitcoin or like a mindset they have with their Bitcoin. Yeah. Do you see anything missing currently in this educational or Bitcoin like creator space? Do I see something missing? I mean, now that I stopped writing my newsletter, that's missing for sure. But yeah, w what I really want to see, which is what you're doing and also my colleague Joel is doing with Rabbit Hole Tales is just hearing people's stories, like not macro talk, even though that has a place too, or like not just technology talk, but also just hearing people's stories. Because as I said, it's it can be lonely up there. And I like hearing real stories from real people that use Bitcoin in their daily life or stable coins or lightning or even shit coins. Just so you can put, so you can like put a face to like to the, to the use case. And that's, that's kind of inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, what I really like is that there's so many different people from so many different backgrounds and upbringing and ages and religion and all these things that are conveying on Bitcoin. And that has really been like one of the things that made me more enthusiastic, like, okay, but what binds these people? Why why are they gravitating towards this, this thing? And I, I don't think I've ever met like a Bitcoiner that I didn't like because there's already a certain type of, you, you connect over certain subject or interest or maybe this curiosity again, that just creates also a nice human connection, right? Like I would also argue, like if you like Bitcoin, go to a conference sometimes and just see, especially if you feel alone, see that there's so many other people that are into the same thing. When I went to my first Bitcoin conference in Amsterdam was last year. So after almost 10 years in Bitcoin, I went to a Bitcoin conference. I went into a room for a talk and the room was totally full and I had to stand in the back, like in the hallway. And then I realized, damn, all these people are into the same thing. That's crazy, right? Like then it, it becomes real if you see other people like online, it's still a bit abstract. Even we are having this call right now, it's still abstract. We are not in the same room, right? Yeah, yeah that, that really helped me. Yeah, it's a bunch of freaks in the same room, but at least yeah. you feel connected to them. <laughs> but I, I would say don't even go to a conference. I'd, I'd say go to a meetup to have Our a few meetup. beers. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, those are those are even better. So how... How do you see like the development of Bitcoin now that, you know, it's also in the 
in the political sphere, do you think that's a good thing or do you think there's there's risks attached to that? I think it is what it is. I don't really think if it's good or bad. Like, I think we should be ready for Bitcoin to be more politicized because it's like when it was a small asset, it was easy to ignore it. But now it's pushing one trillion and soon it's going to be a 10 trillion asset, so bigger than gold. So it is already entering geopolitical stage. Different different countries are using it, like Bhutan, probably Russia has a lot of Bitcoin, El Salvador. So it is getting more politicized. We just have to stay vigilant and call out if we see something wrong, like, for example, with the Bitcoin core development. I don't know. Is that what you asked about, like the, the core development or like some kind of other development? No, just like like I see Bitcoin as a, it's, it's an apolitical thing right because it's it's eventually it's a protocol you know the the thing itself is apolitical i'd say the use case is a political subject in a sense right i mean some people are the defenders of fiat money obviously other people think other people think there should be like more of like a free market so eventually the the use case but now that it's really onto this stage and uh, you know uh, everyone looks at american politics of course so it it is in some way big or at least it's it's there on that stage, right? And as you said, like if more countries adopt or, you know, news breaks that, I don't know, Oman or Qatar has like 2 billion in Bitcoin, that's really going to accelerate, well, I'd say discussion slash adoption. Um, yeah. Yeah, what, what's going to happen is going to happen, which is, I think, the jo- our job, especially people who have a voice, who are active on social media, it's our job to just call out bad practices. We're like the, like the the Bitcoin's social layer where, you know, like immune system. That's why it's it's really hard to be dishonest in Bitcoin because Bitcoiners have such a high filter and such a high barrier, like standard for truth. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't see a lot of dishonest people in the Bitcoin space, especially at at least publicly. But uh, Bitcoin is going to grow and it is apolitical, just like a knife is apolitical. It's just a tool. You can do whatever you want with a knife and same with Bitcoin. And people yeah. are going to use it for different purposes. They're, they can use Bitcoin to buy illegal weapons and do bad things. You can use it for good things. Bitcoin is money for the enemies. and That's, that's the whole beauty of it. People, politicians, organizations will use it how they see fit. And it's just our job to call them out if we see something shady happening. Yeah, well, I think if you're in on Bitcoin Twitter, then you definitely see that happening, right? And I think it's a good, a good thing because there, yeah, there are certain principles attached to to Bitcoin that I think should be defended. Yeah, as you said, it's kind of like freedom of speech, right? You want your enemies to be able to use it, so you're able to use it, right? And you don't have to trust them because that's the entire point of, of Bitcoin. But it's the same, like freedom of speech is like you you should allow other people to say things that you don't like, right? Because then you can you can say the things that you do like, right? It, it's a it's a two way street in that sense. What what's like the most exciting potential use case for Bitcoin that you think isn't widely discussed yet? A use case for Bitcoin. Honestly, the killer use case for Bitcoin is money. I that's that's my number one focus. That's what I'm interested about. That's why I wanna see that's what I want to see happen in the world is I want to see a fair money that gives people hope. I'm not really paying any attention to any other Bitcoin use cases. Yeah, good point. I've, I don't know if I should have used the word use cases. I think it's more like uses, but yeah, I, uh, I, I'll go ahead. I, I think, yeah, I think it's just Bitcoin uses to me, to me, it's, it's just like it allows us to build a long term vision. And it's going to be really interesting to see what a world looks like on a Bitcoin standard. Yeah. Like it's going to be a very different world. And, you know, I'm just here with my popcorn, having a f- front row seat and yes. enjoying. I feel exactly like that. You know, we're going to talk about this for the rest of our lives and we're going to see how it's going to play out. Like w- when you think about this hyper Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoinized world, how does that look like? Well, like, what does the future look like for for millennials and 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 Gen Z and 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 the younger generations after them? I think it really depends how it happens. 
So I, I, I'm not one of these people that cheer for like a big event where, you know, the global financial system collapses and Bitcoin, like a savior, jumps on the stage. And it's like, here, I'm here because I, I don't want to see pain in the world. But I also don't think it's going to be that smooth of a transition. There is going to be friction. There is going to be people in the old system resisting it. But honestly, like what Bitcoin looks like in a post hyper Bitcoinization world, whatever that even means. I don't even know what that means. Like, honestly, like, I don't want to speculate. I just want to live through it and see for myself. But definitely all the things that we discussed, like more long term thinking, more hopeful world, more optimistic people, more wealth that. All right. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question, which Oof. is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Well, is that you should just stay humble and stack sets. Awesome. Well, great ender. Thanks so much for this conversation. I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, man, you stay in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Bram. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.